influence. Like it or not, we are all subject to being influenced by others. And reciprocally, we all have the capacity to influence others as well. You might think of influence as the act of swaying or persuading someone to change their thoughts or their behavior. Now, influence can be good or bad. It may be wicked. It may be righteous. It can be positive or it can be negative. There are many definitions for the word influence and that they cover both the good and the bad meanings of the word. For example, one definition of the word influence, if I'm quoting from the Webster's Dictionary, means the source of occult power long held by the wicked to derive from the stars. You may not know it, but the word influenza the origin of that word comes from the thought, uh, the superstitious thought, I'll add, that uh, epidemics were caused by the stars. Now, you and I both know that the stars don't cause people to do wicked things, but Satan and his sure can. On the other hand, influence may also be defined as the origin of spiritual or moral force such as when the unction of the Holy Spirit works in man. No matter how wise you are, you, you can be influenced by Satan and the ways of the world. We're going to take one example today, the wisest of all, King Solomon. Open your Bibles as we begin our study today to 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. Even King Solomon was subject to the influence of, of evil and wicked. First Kings chapter 11, verse one, we ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Now, when we say the word strange, doesn't mean that their behavior was strange or unacceptable. This word means that he loved foreign women together or beside the daughter of Pharaoh, of course she was Egyptian, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, the Zidonians, and Hittites. He didn't mess around, he had them from all over the place, I'll tell you. Uh, Solomon was influenced by the three W's, uh, wealth, weapons, and women, particularly uh, foreign women, heathen women. Verse 2, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them. Well, where did God say ye shall not take foreign wives to be, women to be your wives? Exodus chapter 34, verse 16. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3 in the following verses. He said, don't give your daughters to their sons to wife. Don't take their daughters to your sons to wife. If you do, the result is going to be children and you're going to end up worshiping their gods, small g. God knew what he was talking about. Neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart, your mind, you could translate the word heart. After their gods, Solomon clave unto these in love, to these foreign women. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 4, were to cleave to the Lord. Solomon clave to the foreign women. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart, turned away his mind from serving God. They influenced him in a negative way. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, small g. And his heart was not perfect, this word means whole or complete, with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now, David was not perfect in all respects. And guess what? None of us are. 
But as far as idolatry was concerned, David was perfect. He, he, he never strayed from following the Lord. All the future kings of Judah, many of the future kings of Israel, would be compared to David as far as their steadfastness in their walk with the Lord. For Solomon went after Ashtaroth. This is, she's also called Ishtar by the Assyrians. She's the, the Phoenician goddess of love and fertility. The word Easter comes from Ishtar and goddess of the Zidonians. And after Milcom, also called Molech in verse 7, the abomination of the Ammonites. Now, Molech, people sacrifice their children through fire to this. God, in one place in the Old Testament, he said, how could you do that? I, that thought never even crossed my mind, God said. He's a pretty intelligent feller. And if that thought had never crossed his mind, uh, it was pretty abominable. Verse 6. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father. What's the lesson in this for us? Stay focused. Don't be persuaded. Don't be swayed. Don't be pulled off track by Satan and the evil ways of the world. In Solomon's case, by the foreign women. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh. Chemosh is the sun god of the Moabites, also worshipped by the Ammonites. And he's related to Baal Peor in Numbers chapter 25. The abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem. The hill that is before Jerusalem is the Mount of Olives. In the time of Josiah, when he was a very righteous king of Judah, when he was cleaning up the mess of all this idolatry, it was called the mountain of corruption, 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 13. Solomon was the one who was making Mount of Olives corrupt. And for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 27, God said, don't do it. Don't worship the gods of the other nations. If you do, I'm going to scatter you from one end of the earth to the other. Look at Israel today. The ten northern tribes scattered. Most of them don't even know who they are. They're, they're scattered to, from one end of the earth to the other. Verse 8. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. Now let's see. He had 700 wives, he had 300 concubines, and Solomon built a little altar on the Mount of Corruption for each one of them. That's a thousand idolatrous altars. No wonder the Mount of Olives was called the Mount of Corruption by King Josiah. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Check out this word angry in your strongs. It's anaph. And it means it's used only of divine anger. God's anger. And it's in particularly used when one forces themselves to be angry with someone that they love. What did God name Solomon? He named him Jedediah. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 25, which means loved of Yah. God loved Solomon. He didn't love what Solomon was doing. Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel and had appeared unto him, which had appeared unto him twice. God thought so much of Solomon, he appeared to him twice in a dream. And, and the first time, you remember, he asked, what will you have? And Solomon said, give me wisdom so I can reign such a, a, a great nation as Israel. God gave him wisdom and told him, because you didn't ask for wealth or long life, I'm going to add those things to you as well. Verse 10, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Don't compromise. 
Don't be influenced by Satan or the wicked ways of the world. Don't allow anything to pull you off track to the point that you worship the Antichrist for you elect that could be the unforgivable sin. Verse 11, wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant, one Jeroboam by name. And if we continued on in this chapter, it happened uh, even before the conclusion of this chapter. We're not going to continue on, but God rent or tore 10 of the 12 tribes and gave them to Jeroboam while Solomon's son Rehoboam kept only Judah and Benjamin. There was another king of, of Judah. His name was Ahab. Ahab didn't need any influence to do evil. He was just naturally kind of wicked and evil type person. But he had someone who did influence him to do even more evil. Her name was Jezebel. Turn with me over to chapter 21 of the same book. Chapter 21, we're going to pick it up with verse 15. But, and, and you all know what happened in the first part of chapter 21. There was a gentleman by the name of Naboth. Uh, Naboth didn't, he was a good man. The only bad part or bad thing for Naboth was that he owned the property right next to Ahab. And Ahab uh, coveted, became jealous of Naboth's vineyard. And he said, Naboth, give me your vineyard and I'll give you one over here that's even better. Or, or if you want, I'll pay you. I'll give you money for your vineyard. Naboth was a good man. He knew that you couldn't or shouldn't trade or sell your inheritance. That's what Esau was guilty of doing, was trading his inheritance for a bowl of red pottage, you might recall. Well, Ahab went home and gave up and was laid down in bed and he was pouting. He turned his head to the wall. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. He didn't want to see anybody. He didn't want to talk to anybody. And Jezebel came up to him and said, Pooh Bear, what's the matter with you? That was what she called him was Pooh Bear. That was her nickname for, for Ahab. And he said, Naboth won't give me his vineyard. And she said, are you the king or not? And she took matters in her own hands. She made up a false report and sent a letter under Ahab's signet ring saying, Naboth blasphemed God and the king. Pull up two witnesses, false witnesses, and then stone him to death. And that's what they did. They stoned Naboth to death so Ahab could have his vineyard. Let's pick it up with verse 15. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of thy vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Naboth is not alive but dead. Now you can plant your, your herb garden, Pooh Bear. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Now, Naboth had two sons. They should have been the ones who inherited Naboth's vineyard. We learn in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 26, why they didn't inherit their father's vineyard. They were killed by Ahab and Jezebel as well. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, you think God's happy? with what Ahab has done to Naboth and his family. Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it. And I misspoke earlier. I said Ahab was the king of Judah. He wasn't. He was the king of the northern tribes. Verse 19. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed? This word is raksa in the Hebrew. It means especially to murder. Let's say it like it is. Hast thou murdered 
and also taken possession. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. There are no unsolved mysteries with our Heavenly Father. Ahab thought he had gotten away with murder. He didn't get away with it. He was going to pay for it. He gets his, Ahab does, uh, in Assyria. Um, his son, Joram, his, after he's killed, will, his corpse will be thrown out. Guess where? Naboth's vineyard. And the dogs licked up the blood of Joram. Was that the blood of Ahab? Yes, it was. He was Ahab's son. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? <clears throat> in, this, in this we see that Carmel really had no effect on Ahab at all. Uh, what happened there when the, when the uh, drought ended. And he answered, I have found thee because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Ahab was a slave to doing evil. Jezebel uh, provoked him and enticed him and uh, influenced him to do even more. <coughs> Excuse me, verse 21. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee and will take away thy posterity. That's your seed, your children. And will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall. That's a figure of speech that means every male in the family. And him that is shut up and left in Israel. To be shut up and left is to be uh, supposedly, or you think you're in a fortified, secure place, such as a walled city, for example. Uh, they're not safe because God, nobody can hide from God is the point. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the first man king of the ten northern tribes, Jeroboam. Remember, he's the one who made the golden calf, two of them, as a matter of fact, put one in Dan and one in Bethel. Told the people of Jerusalem, you don't, or the people of Israel, you don't need to go down in, to Jerusalem to worship. Worship these two golden calves. He appointed his own priests. He appointed his own religious holidays. Uh, God was not happy with Jeroboam. Every male of Jeroboam's house was also wiped out. And like the house of Baasha, Baasha murdered the second king of the ten northern tribes, uh, and he wasn't uh, very well thought of by the Lord either. The son of Ahiah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. As the leader of a nation goes, as the king of a nation goes, usually so goes the nation. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall or the ditch of Jezreel. No decent burial for Jezebel. This came to pass. 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 30. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Nahab, Ahab's son Jerom's uh, corpse thrown in the vineyard of Naboth. And this is the curse of Deuteronomy 28, 26. No decent burial. Verse 25, the reason we came here. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. Even as wicked as Ahab was, Jezebel still influenced Ahab to do worse. And he did very, he, he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, one of the tribes of the Canaanites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel, ran them off from the promised land. They didn't do their part. Verse 27. And it came to pass when Ahab heard those words, the, the words of God through Elijah the prophet, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth 
and went softly. This means he went humbly. What we have here, he's in mourning, if you will. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbit, saying, Now, if you ever have thought that you've done something so terrible that God just won't forgive you, always remember this next verse. Verse 29, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me, God speaking? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. We, we do have a God of grace. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it states there that God is long-suffering. That means that he's patient, not willing that any should perish, any of his children should perish but that all would come to repentance. Ahab has got a repentant heart here. Not all the kings of Israel were wicked and evil. Uh, no doubt Ahab and Jezebel had a bad influence on the people of Israel. Hezekiah, on the other hand, had a good influence on the people of Judah. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 29 as we continue our study <clears throat> on influence. 2 Chronicles 29. Book of Kings written by man, man's point of view. Chronicles, on the other hand, written by the Holy Spirit. We find in Chronicles God's point of view of the same events that are recorded in Samuel and Kings. In Kings, we find three verses uh, concerning the religious, uh, um, what is that word that I'm looking for? The, the religious uh, respect that Hezekiah had for the Lord reinstituting the, the Passover, uh, opening up the, the tabernacle. Three verses in Kings where we have three chapters in Chronicles uh, indicating the importance that God put on this religious reformation. Reformation was the word I was looking for a moment ago. Chapter 29, verse 1 of Second Chronicles, and it reads... Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abiah, the daughter of Zechariah. Now, Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, with a Z rather than Ahab with a B, was a very wicked king as well. He closed the temple of God. One of the first things that Hezekiah will do is reopen the temple, verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. Again, I mentioned earlier that all the future kings of Judah would be compared to David as to how they uh, steadfast they were in their walk with the Lord. We're 14 generations from King David at this point, to Hezekiah. 14 in biblical numerics is salvation and deliverance. Uh, the 14th day of the first month, Abib or Nisan on the Hebrew calendar, God delivered Israel from uh, the Egyptians' bondage. The, Pas the Passover, the Exodus began. Verse 3, he in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he didn't mess around. The first month of the first year of his reign opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. No time wasted. He knew that the problems that had befallen Judah uh, were due to the actions of his father Ahaz and the other people who followed Ahaz. And he brought in the priest and the Levites and gathered them together unto the east street. Now this would be a broad place on the east side of the temple, not in the temple. It's, it's time to restore worship in the land of Judah. Worship brings blessings. And he brought in the priests, we got that, verse 5, and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, 
sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. It had been polluted with idolatry by Ahaz and those who followed him. Hezekiah is admonishing the Levites and the priests and the people of, of Judah to, to change their behavior, to change their thoughts. He's, he's being a positive influence on the people of Judah. For our fathers, Ahaz and, and, and his followers, have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. You know, God will never leave you or forsake you. It's written in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. But I'll tell you what, if you turn your back on him, he will turn his back on you. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. Our father has emotions. He has feelings, just like we do. And it hurts him when his children turn their backs on him. Verse 7. Also, they have shut up the doors of the porch. This is where the entranceway to the temple would be. And put out the lamps, the candlesticks, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. When Ahaz made a trip, uh, I believe it was to uh, the, the Syrians, he went and he saw an altar there that their king had. And he sent word, a message back to the high priest, Uriah, and said, I want you to make an offer to offer to Yahweh, just like the king of Syria has. Do you think God would accept offerings on an altar that was just like the king of Syria, a heathen? Absolutely not. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonishment, and to hissing, that means to whistle in scorn, as you see with your eyes, humiliating defeat after defeat. Judah had been defeated by the Syrians, the Ephraimites, uh, the, in other words, the 12 tribes, Philistines, the Edomites, and now they were in subject, subjection to the king of Assyria. Hezekiah knew all these things had come upon Judah because they had turned their backs on Yahweh. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this, in captivity to the Assyrians temporarily at this point in time. Verse 10, Now it is in mine heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel, that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. Let's restore the covenant. Let's repent Verse 11, my sons, here he's addressing the Levites uh, tenderly or kindly, be not now negligent, don't be careless or lazy, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, that you should minister unto him and burn incense. Hezekiah had the right idea. Let's get back with God and things will get better. That's the same today, beloved if things aren't going well in your life, get back with God. Things will get better. God, uh, I should say Jesus, encouraged us to be a positive influence on others in the New Testament. Turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, let's pick it up with verse 38. And John answered him, him being Jesus, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us, and we forbade him, because he followeth not us. Now, do you think 
someone who could cast out a demon in the name of Jesus Christ? Do you think it was because they f were following John and the other disciples? No. If someone could do that, they're following Christ. You always want to keep your eye on Christ. Follow Christ. Follow the example that, that he set for us. John's saying, you know, there's, there's this guy down here from this other church. He's another denomination. And he, he's doing this. And we told him, stop it. You're not one of our group. You're not one of our church. But Jesus said, forbid him not. For there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. If he's doing miracles in the name of Jesus Christ, he believes in Jesus Christ. You know, some denominations think they're the only ones that are going to be in heaven. That reminds me of a joke. I think the last joke my mother ever told me. This guy died and he went to heaven. And St. Peter was showing him around. He said, yeah, over there is denomination A. And they, they, they really like it up here. And they went down the road a little bit. And goes, and he goes, no, there's, there's denomination B. They, they really like it up here. And they got down the road a little further and... St. Peter said, over there's denomination C. And the person said, well, how come they're over here by themselves? And Peter went, shh, they think they're the only ones up here. <laughs> Verse 40, for he that is not against us is on our part. Don't ever forget that verse. Other denominations, other Christians aren't our enemies. Satan is our enemy. And you know what? When the denominations start getting into it, Satan sits up there and laughs. It makes his day when he sees Christians fighting over who's right and who's wrong instead of keeping their eye on Jesus. Verse 41 for whosoever shall give you a cup of water to drink in my name, you might think of a cup of living water, that water that you'll never thirst again. Because ye belong to Christ, verily I say unto you, he shall not lose his reward. Verse 42, and whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. A millstone's very heavy. Nobody's a good enough swimmer that they're going to carry a millstone with them in the sea swimming. They're going to drown. This word offend, check it out, and it's in the Greek. It's word 4624 in your Greek dictionary in the strong. It means to scandalize. It means to entrap. It means to cause to fall or cause to sin. You know what? This is the way God feels about those who are a negative influence on someone who believes in him. I always remember Pastor Arnold always said that if someone comes against you, in a negative way, does something evil to you, do you need to take retaliation right then? No. Wait three months, four months, five months, six months. Let God take care of it. God doesn't like it when someone offends someone who loves him. Verse 43 and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Now don't think about a flesh body here. I want you to think, as this is intended, we're talking about the many-membered body of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the church here. Don't, don't go cutting your hand off because you did something stupid with your hand. That's not what this is talking about. 
It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, Gehenna in the Greek, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Gehenna is a garbage pile outside of Jerusalem. When an animal died, they threw the animal on the garbage pile. They threw garbage on the garbage pile. It, it, it burned continuously. The fire, the smoke, and the stench never went out. But think about this as the church now. If, if a member or of your church is influencing the congregation in a negative way, such a negative way that it might cause them to end up in hell rather than heaven, cut them off. That's the way you deal with problems in the church. If you got a problem, child, cut them off. Verse 44, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The maggots uh, are very busy in, in, in Gehenna, the pile. The fire never goes out. Jesus continues concerning the many-membered body. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt or lame into life, the flesh life in other words, than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Again, the body is the many-membered body, the church. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Twice for emphasis. Jesus continues, and if thine eye offend thee, another part of the body of the, the many member body of Christ, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Don't allow negative Satan, those that follow him, the world to influence you. Don't allow it to cause you to fall or sin. Cut it off. Verse 48, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Three times for emphasis. The reason we came here, sharpen up for me. Verse 49, for every one shall be salted with fire. You can think of this as when God sends his spirit to you, the Holy Spirit. And every sacrifice shall be salted with fire salt. Leviticus chapter 2 verse 13, uh, you're to salt the, all of your meat offerings and your oblations. Well, let me ask you, what does salt do? Well, salt changes the flavor of something when we're eating it. And that's what Jesus means here. He's saying as a Christian, we should make a difference, a, a change for the good, a change for the positive. When, when you walk into a room, that the, 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 the spirit of that room should be changed if it was evil and wicked. Why? Because Jesus Christ is in you. Verse 50, Jesus continues, salt is good. But if the salt have lost its saltiness, in other words, if it's lost its ability to make a change, wherewith will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Be salty as a Christian. Make a difference. Be a positive influence in this world. Lord knows there's enough negative influences out there be a positive influence wherever you go. In conclusion, uh, Peter warns us in 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, which is where we're going in conclusion. Peter warns us to be steadfast there, to, to not be persuaded by Satan and the ways of the world. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, and it reads, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Peter was there. 
and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Now, this is addressed to the elders, the elders of the elect, if you will. That's you, beloved. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Christ would say to Peter three times. The first time he said, feed my lambs. The second two times he said, feed my sheep. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint. Don't, don't do it because you have to, but willingly, because you want to. Not with for filthy lucre, that's money, but of a ready mind, of a willing mind. You know, if you're a preacher and you're in it for the money, the lucre, you're in it for the wrong reason. You're not going to be successful. Verse 3, neither or not as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Set the example. Be a positive influence in this world that is so full of negative. Edify the body of Christ. Don't tear it down. Verse 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, come, Lord Jesus, come, the second advent. He shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Paul says there that I have a crown, and so does everyone else who loves the appearing of the Lord. I know you look forward to and love the appearing of the Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. You know, we can make a bit of a positive influence in this world of negative. He can make a big influence. And he is going to do it. He's going to straighten this mess out. I begin to think he's the only one that can. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud. That means that God opposes the proud. That was Satan's downfall, was his pride. What does oppose mean? Well, it means you're an opponent. It means you're on the other team. You don't ever want to be an opponent to God, because you're on the wrong team, friend. You're on the losing team. Exalt yourself and be prepared to be abased. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Written in many places. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7. Casting all your care, all your anxiety, all your worries upon him for he careth for you. Think about that. The Lord cares about you. And you can cast all your problems, all your worries, all your anxieties on him. And he takes them. Verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He, he wants you. He wants your soul. He knows his goose is cooked. He wants your soul to go to hell with him. The reason we came here, verse 9, whom resist. In other words, resist Satan steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Nothing new. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There's nothing going to happen to you that's not common to man. It, the same thing that's happening to you has happened to somebody else before. But remain steadfast. That, that's the message. Don't be influenced by others. Stay focused on Jesus Christ, 
Stay focused on the word of God. But the God of all grace, is that the God of some grace? No, the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect. That means complete or mature. Establish, strengthen, settle you. Verse 11, to conclude, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And I'll add, amen. When the ways of the world overwhelm you, it seems that they're overwhelming you, don't let the ways of the world influence you. Pull out your Bible. Focus on the word of God. Things get better. And don't ever forget that verse. Cast your cares on him and he'll take them. But why? Because he cares about you. Don't ever forget to thank him. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for this word, Father, that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father. You have a group here that wants to be pleasing to you, Father, that wants to serve you. Continue to open your will through your Holy Spirit, through your word to us, Father, that we can help accomplish your will in these end times. Let everything that we do the rest of this day be to the honor and glory of your name. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Arkansas, do you believe we'll have kings and queens in the third age? Yes. Read Revelation chapter 21, verse 24. Uh, that's well into the eternity, uh, the third earth and heaven age, that's to say. And we have kings on earth, uh, the nations there and, and there, the ethnos. And uh, I believe... Uh, Melchizedek will be there as well. He's a king, as you know. In fact, Melka means king. Uh, Zedek means the elect, king of the elect. So yes, we'll have kings. We'll have the king of kings and the lord of lords there as well. Uh, Revelation chapter 19 will document. Elaine from Vermont, how will we travel in the third age? Do you think we will travel the universe? Yes, I do. Uh, I believe we'll have the ability to travel the universe in vehicles such as God's throne uh, was transported to earth in, in Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, Ezekiel describes that vehicle as being amber in color. Check out that word amber in your Strong's Concordance. It means highly polished bronze. So uh, now am I talking about spaceships? No, I'm talking about uh, the horses of the Bible. And there's a message that Pastor Arnold Murray did entitled Horses of the Bible if you'd like a study on that. Uh, I believe Pastor Arnold Murray probably has access uh, to one of the finer uh, vehicles available uh, as a reward and for all his years of serving the Lord, teaching the Word. That was his wish to have one of those vehicles. Ronnie from Arkansas, Luke chapter 2, verse 46. In the Nelson Bible, it says, Teacher. King James says, Doctor, please help. Thank you for your teaching. Well, uh, that's why you want to work with a 
King James Version Bible rather than other translations. If you have questions, you can look it up in your Strong's Concordance. And if you look up the word that you're wrestling with, you'll find that in the Strong's Concordance, you'll find that it's the Greek word uh, 1320, uh, didas kalos, which means in the King James Version, it's translated doctor, master, teacher. So you can see where Nelson got their translation. Doesn't, doesn't really matter. Pat in Indiana, uh, thank you, thank you for your kind comments. Um, I do not understand about the two witnesses and where the Antichrist comes from. Germany, question mark. God bless you all. The Antichrist is cast out of heaven. Uh, and you can read about that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 in the following verses. And we learn there that Satan and his angels war against Michael, the archangel, and his angels, Michael prevails and casts Satan and his angels out onto earth. That's when the Antichrist will be here. The two witnesses you can read about in Revelation chapter 11 for one place, and it states there that they will be here for a period of time before the Antichrist appears. Uh, what will their main function be? Well, they'll be communicating God's plan to the elect. They're called the sons of oil in Zechariah chapter 4 and the olive trees in Revelation chapter 11. And the oil, always symbolic of truth, they're going to be pumping that truth uh, to God's elect uh, while the Antichrist is here on earth. Nina in Connecticut. And I'm having trouble finding where your question starts. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40. Scripture explains all the laws and prophets hang on these two commandments. Therefore, have all the other laws and commandments been abolished or are they carried over on these two commandments, the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. Well, uh, one, the first commandment listed there in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 in the following verses, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, that covers the first five commandments. The first five commandments as you find in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter, two, excuse me, Exodus uh, chapter 20, you'll find have to do with man's relationship with God. The second uh, in, that you find in Matthew 22, verse 36 in the following verses is, Love thy neighbor as thyself. The last five commandments in Exodus chapter 20 have to do with man's relationship with man. So in essence, those two the Ten Commandments are abbreviated in those two commandments. You follow with the second question, should Christians support celebration of the holidays or are these all pagan holidays? Well, uh, if you're talking about Christmas, we celebrate Christmas as the conception date of Jesus Christ. The Word became flesh. The only other religious holiday that we celebrate here at Shepherd's Chapel is uh, Passover. And that is translated incorrectly only one time in the book of Acts as Easter. And it should have been translated Passover, Pascha uh, in, in the languages. Charles in North Carolina, how would you know if you are one of God's elect? Okay, good question. If you understand God's overall plan, uh, primarily you, you'd have to know that the Antichrist comes first before Jesus returns. Um, that you probably if are one of God's elect. If you understand the three world ages, Paul described the three world ages as the mystery of God. And if you don't understand the three world ages, you're never going to understand uh, God's word. You're, you're not going to be one of God's elect, I don't believe. 
Gil from Virginia. Your question and answer, and you give a date I'm not going to mention. Someone asked, did Eve and the serpent have sexual relations? And you said, yes. I think you referred to Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If they did, who were Eve and the serpent's children? Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. Well, there you're mistaken. You see, Cain was not Adam's child. You'll find Adam's genealogy in Genesis chapter 5. Cain's not there. Cain's genealogy is totally separate, and you'll find it in Genesis chapter 4. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 makes it very clear that Eve conceived, and God said, I'm going to greatly multiply your conception. You follow the serpent was a fallen angel. Angels don't have sexual relations with humans. And you mentioned Matthew 22, 30 and Mark 13, but oh yes, they do. That's what was going on in Genesis chapter 6 when the sons of God, as they're called there, that's the angels, uh, came to earth. They saw the daughters of Adam. They liked what they saw. They went into them and children were the result, Geber, giants in the Hebrew language. I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal. Why? because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. You know what, it makes your father's day when he looks down and he sees you studying the letter that he wrote to you. It makes his day and blessings always follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. There's one thing that's most important though and it's this. You stay in His Word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.